All right, let's dig in. Finding Nemo, Disney Pixar movie that came out in the early 2000s. If you have not seen it, pause right now and go watch it because we're going to spoil it. All right, you've been warned. The whole story is about a little fish who disobeys his dad, who rebels against what his father has told him to do. They don't go out in the open water, and he thinks, man, I can do better. I can do this on my own. Dad doesn't know what he's talking about. He goes out, immediately regrets his decision when he's captured, and the rest of the movie is his dad trying to find him across the open ocean and to get him back. And so why are we starting with this story? It's because it's a familiar storyline to us. It's not hard for us to identify with because all of us at some point have felt that like rebellion of I know better. I have a better way of doing this than my mom, than my dad, than my grandma, than my grandpa, than my teachers, and whoever is in charge of you, right? And we have this urge to kind of do things our own way and say, this is what they've told us to do, but I'm going to do this differently. And the story we're going to look at today in the book of Luke is very similar to this. It's a parable that Jesus tells that is so similar to this idea that a son that rebels and regrets it. And Jesus teaches us so much about himself through this. And we're going to get to see that, what he teaches about himself and some things we can see about us in this. And both ends in a joyful reunion, both Finding Nemo and this story. I'm pretty sure Finding Nemo borrowed from this, not the other way around, but let's dig in Luke chapter 15 and let's get started. So Luke chapter 15 verse 11, it's a parable that Jesus tells that helps people understand the heavenly truth through an earthly story. And so it's just a basic story about human life, but Jesus has a meaning that it's deeper that reveals something about himself. So verse 11 says this, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Jump ahead to verse 17. It says, But when he came to himself, meaning this younger son, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older brother was in the field. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This story it's a picture of a father with two sons that are sinful. And it is the father's response to the son's sin and the son's response to the father that we can learn so much in here. So first, let's just look at the, the different brothers we have here. We have the younger brother who is extremely brash, disrespectful. Right? And that day, right, the inheritance was given mostly to the older brother, right? To the firstborn son, got the majority of his father's estate. The title, the money, the lands, everything. And then the second son and the other sons and children down the line would get a smaller portion of it. But again, this happens, right? Inheritance are, are given when the father dies, right? And his younger son goes to his father, who's still alive, and says, I want what you owe me brash, disrespectful, greedy. He says, I want what you owe me. Give it to me. And the father just gives it to him. And the son, a few days later, packs it all up, heads out of town, leaves, and 
burns through it all, blows through it all, on immoral, reckless living. And the older brother calls it much more clearly. Like he's not trying to sugarcoat it. Right? He just says, he spent all of your money on prostitutes. It's a picture of his sin, right? It's an obvious thing. He's disrespectful. He's greedy. He's selfish. He's prideful. And he's living immorally. It's easy to point out that sin. Like, you and I can see, okay, this is probably not a good situation. But then you have the older brother. And the thing is, is he's just as sinful, he's just not as aware of it. Right? The older brother, man, he acts right, he's responsible, he's obedient, right? He's, he's like the perfect son in terms of the actions he's done. Right? He's on time for work with dad, he doesn't like take days off, he doesn't just like waste the time. He, he's obedient, he does the right things. And his sin is selfishness, pride, disrespect of his father, greed self-righteousness. He has this idea that I am better than my brother who's sinful because of what I've done, because I'm on time to work, because I'm obedient, because I've never betrayed you, Father, like your younger son has, right? And that in and of itself is a sin of self-righteousness. It makes him just as sinful as the younger brother. And the beautiful picture of the Father, who is Jesus, right? The Father's story represents Jesus, represents God. The Father loves both, not because of their actions, good or bad, right? He's not like, man, I don't like this son because of his bad actions. I love this son because of his good actions. He loves them both because they're his sons. It's an amazing reminder to you and I that it is not my actions, good or bad, that determine my standing with God. It is the fact that I am a son or daughter of his. If I've given my life to him, that is why he loves me. He loves me because he made me and he has bought me back at a price. Right? So the father loves them both. And so the younger son's response, right, to his own sin, right? He wakes up one day, buck naked, dirty, in a pig pen, eating out of the pig trough. And he says, and he has this revelation, like, what in the world am I doing? I screwed up royally. I have blown it. I just, there's no excuse. I was wrong. Like, even my father's servants live better than me. Why am I here? Why have I done this? I need to go back. He says, I need to go back and fall at my father's feet and just say, Dad, I've messed up. I don't even need to be your son. Just let me be in your household so I don't starve to death. It's this, it's this picture of repentance, of fully understanding this is, man, the weight of his own sin is weighing on him. And he goes back and he's going to repent, but his father sees him from a long way off and he comes running. And he embraces him and he kisses him. Right? And the picture here is, right, right in this day and age, right, the wronged party had, had no reason to go to the other person. If you are wronged, the other person is responsible to come to you to make it right. So, but this father can't wait. He says, I want things to be restored. I'm going to run to him. Right? And he runs to him and he embraces him. It's a sign of affection. Of Like, I'm not angry at you. I'm not upset at you. Like, you are someone who I hold dear. And then he even goes further and he kisses him. This intimate act of like, man, you are my son. And, the, and, and his son feels this. He says, Dad, I'm sorry. I've screwed up and I don't deserve to be your son anymore. So let me be a servant. And he says, that's ridiculous. Don't be stupid. And he tells his servants, bring a robe, the finest robe from my house, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, right? It's the signet ring of the family. Like, it gives him his sonship back. He's saying, hey, you aren't just a servant. You are my son. And cover his feet. And we're going to go have a party and kill the best calf and eat it. And it's going to be awesome because my son is back. It's a picture of the restoration, right? That his repentance leads to restoration. And Jesus wanted to restore him even before the repentance happened. I think of that. Right? And then the older son, right? He's just got this sin of self righteousness. And this guy I see, I I don't know, like he just seems like he has zero fun in life and he does not enjoy anything. He's all about like I will be obedient and good. And again, not a bad thing to be obedient and good, but like he lives to be a rule follower. And like he, he says in verse twenty five, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came 
and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing and called on the servants and asked them what these things meant. It's like, is this guy so unfamiliar with enjoying life and having a good time that he, like, music and dancing? What is that? Why? What is going on? Like, I only know work, spreadsheets, like, whatever. Like, he's just so obsessed with doing the things that will give himself validation in his own mind. I'm a good son. I'm obedient. And he goes through and he says all these things. He does them and he's, and he's doing them. And his response is bitterness and pouting, right? It says, I'm not going to go to that party. I'm not going to celebrate my brother. In fact, his sin of self-righteousness leads him to sin against his brother. Why in the world would you not rejoice the restoration of your brother? It's because you are so consumed with what you think you have earned and what they have not earned. Self-righteousness is so hard to repent of because it requires the acknowledgement that you and I have no righteousness on our own. And apart from Jesus, we have nothing to offer. That's hard to say. If you're in a pig pen, buck naked, dirty, eating pig slop, it's easy to say, I'm bringing nothing to the table here. Jesus, I need you. But when you can point to your resume of, these are all the actions I've done right. These are how I've been obedient. God, I haven't done anything my other brother's done, right? This is how good I am. It's hard to say, that stuff doesn't matter. I bring nothing to the table. Jesus, I need you. But you still have to humble yourself. Right? It's an amazing thing. And the Father has to come in and intervene and say, hey, you are still my son. Me restoring your brother does not mean you're any less my son or you're any less loved. You are still fully loved. Everything I have is given to you. And he reminds him, it is good that we celebrate the return and restoration of your brother because he was lost and he's found. And as someone who is not self-righteous, we have to have this mindset of, Jesus, I've done nothing of which makes me worthy of being loved by you. And so, with that in mind, there's nothing someone else can do that should exclude them from your love if they will fall at your feet and repent. And I should rejoice when that happens. And I need to fall at your feet and repent of thinking I ever brought anything to the table, just like the person who has done all the wrong things. We both need to repent, and we can be excited and overjoyed that we have been restored to you. So, what does this teach us about ourselves? Number one, we can be steeped in sin that's obvious and destructive, and it can ruin your life. It can ruin your enjoyment of God. Right? With the younger son, obvious sin ruined that until he repented and came back. Number two, we can be steeped in sin that is hard to see, but just as destructive, and it can ruin your life. The older brother, think of how strained the relationship between him and his father was that he would not even rejoice and go to the party that his father was throwing. Right? And if you and I missed out on the beautiful, amazing things that Jesus is doing because we're throwing a temper tantrum about someone else that has been restored. And we are saying, but Jesus, look what I've done. Why am I not giving that treatment? The sin of self-righteousness can ruin you just as much as the sin of immorality. It can harness and hurt the relationship with God. And what does God teach us about himself? That his love and forgiveness extends to any who repents of their sin and their sin of self-righteousness whether it's the immoral or the self-righteous, the love and grace of God is extended and his righteousness is extended to anyone who repents and says, Jesus, I bring nothing to the table. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I need you. And the Father says, I will run to you. I will embrace you. I love you. You are my son. You are my daughter. And let's celebrate the restoration. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you want to restore us, whether we have done really bad things or we think we've done really good things, that you want to restore us from the sin of immorality to self-righteousness. You want to restore us from it all and bring us back to yourself into the relationship with you to enjoy the sonship and daughtership of being your son or daughter. And I pray that we would do that, that we would never gloat because of how much we've done and we would never think we're too far gone, but God, that you love us, you want us, and you run to us, embrace us, welcome us into your arms when we repent. I pray that, God, we'd have a spirit of repentance in our hearts every day. God, if we are far from you, we'd repent. If we think we are far above others, we'd repent and enjoy you and your righteousness and your grace. In your name.